Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, and access of the outdoors. Our guest today is Matthew Dickerson. Matthew is a freelance outdoor writer. His interests include cold water fisheries, fly fishing, river ecology, and conservation. He is the chair of the education committee for the Outdoor Writers Association of America. He is also a board member of OA. And in his spare time, I can't imagine he has any spare time, he is a professor at Middlebury College in Vermont. Matt, it's always a pleasure to uh, chat with you, especially when you're on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I know you've, you've won some awards with OWAA with this podcast, so I feel honored that I get to be a part of it. Well, uh, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And, and I have to say this past year in Gulf Shores, there was a lot of tough competition in I, I know you've had your share of interviews. There's a lot of them up uh, on YouTube, and we're, we'll share the, uh, your link to your YouTube channel later. But I have to say, I think podcasting is starting to become more mainstreamish for an organization like the OWAA because Our- there's just everything from conservation to uh, to to angling, whether it's on lakes in the rivers that that you. Uh, enjoy out into the the open water and so it's just really there's a lot of stiff competition and a lot of great opportunities to meet some phenomenal outdoor writers and producers there so again by the way your photo that and our listeners you're going to see a photo behind matt i would love to be there uh wherever that is this is in cat may uh, national park um i have been going there very regularly while i was working on my latest book um, I was going there very regularly since 2015, mostly trying to go to more out of the way rivers, uh, less crowded rivers and, um, doing some fly fishing, uh, obviously for some many different species of trout and salmon. Um, but this was actually my first time this year going to the famous, uh, Brooks river and Brooks camp and Brooks falls, um, bear viewing where they're currently holding the fat bear week competition. The Fat Bear this, Week. Yeah. So this is Brooks Brooks Falls. There were four big browns here while I was there. I think oh, I moved, okay. ah, see, I see a couple I see more it. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's it like? Now, were you observing or were you actually fly fishing at the same time as the bears were on their feasting? Both. I went with my wife and then also with a couple friends. And we spent some time... Just sitting right where, where this photo is, watching the bears at the falls. And that's actually um, within a certain distance. It might be 200 yards. I actually forget. Um, of that falls is close to fishing. Okay. Um, but then uh, I did get into the river a few hundred yards downstream of this point and was fishing and was fishing in the middle of the bears and on multiple occasions had to um, fairly, uh, you don't run, you don't splash panic, but I would say. Um, with a determined pace, clear out of the river and make way for bears who wanted to fish my spot. I, I don't imagine you're going to argue with a bear. And, no. Yeah. And, and you, you actually have to go through a safety training before you can fish there. And they give you a lot of rules. Like if you have a fish on and a bear approaches, you have to break that fish off. And I would say the most painful moment for me was I had just spotted Probably the biggest rainbow trout I had seen all day. He was one of those fish in the upper 20, 20 inches, 27 to 30 inch fish, mm-hmm. standing in the shallows and just zeroing in on a cast that would drop a fly by it without getting the log. And all of a sudden, one of the big bears just steps out of shore right where that rainbow trout was. Oh boy. And- so I never did get to cast for it. And so you have to reel that fly right back in. Oh, yeah. You pull your line in. And if you're snagged or even on a fish, you break it off and you get out of the water. Okay. Now yeah. I think I know why uh, uh, anglers take so many flies with them because oh yeah, if it's not snagging it, it's it's one of those uh, wonderful bears behind you. What? you just... I'm also fishing with a five weight here. Yeah. And um, occasionally, because they're spawning sockeye, you, a sockeye is spooked swims through your line and catches itself on the back. And when you've got a 10 or 12 pound sockeye hooked in the back, 
between the fan or in the tail on a big, heavy current like this, there's really no way you're going to bring that fish in. So you lose some flies on, on salmon also. Okay. One thing I'm curious about, and you've kind of just described it, your experience angling and fly fishing, I mean, and practicing year after year, do you become expert or just really good or just really lucky to put that fly right where you want to put it when you're kind of casting away? Certainly there's, there's a, a mix of luck involved, but there, there's definitely also a lot of practice and a lot of experience. I think, okay. um, there's kind of some, there's definitely good basic technique for, for casting a fly. And then there's all of the experience to how do you adjust that cast in different conditions, whether that means casting a little sidearm to get it under some branches or creative ways of getting a, a better drift when you, when just a normal mind mend isn't quite going to work when the current is really, when the current is really creative and you have to respond uh, to that. So there, there's definitely a lot of uh, technique, a lot of practice and occasionally some some luck involved as well. Okay. Now, can you share? When I'm not catching fish, okay, it's, bad, it's luck. It's bad luck. When I am catching fish, and it's skill. That's the way I like to think about. It. I think that's I think that's that, actually the true uh, explanation. That's just the way I, I want to think of it. That's the that's the, the juxtaposition yeah. for you. So, Alaska. I mean, it's a, such a. I mean, it, the area of Alaska. It's huge. But why this Bristol Bay area? Why? What, what were you doing down there? Is this like I always wanted no. to fish this river? No. I mean, what first brought me there? Well, my first trip uh, to, to the Bristol Bay region was in 20, to when 2003 with my father and he was okay. getting older and I wanted to be able to do just a, a really significant, what I thought at the time, once in a lifetime trip with my father to do a six day float down a river while he was still able to do that. But I didn't think even within a few years of that, he would not have been able to take the trip. But what okay. started me going back regularly beginning in 2015 was initially learning about and writing about the proposed pebble mine, which has been on the news for, for a decade. Right. And I, and I wanted to spend time um, on a couple of the rivers that come right out of ground zero of that proposed mine. And I was interviewing people, a, a range of people from geologists to biologists to people who make their living in the area from the fishing industry uh, and, and trying to get a sense of what their opinions were, the native peoples who, who have been living on that land for millennia. So that's really what initially brought me there. But then it turns out there's a lot more stories than just one particular mine there's you know, been proposed um dams in the bristol bay area for hydroelectric climate change is certainly having an impact on the area the caribou herd just even the last eight years or 10 years has really collapsed in that area so there's a lot of really interesting stories and also really positive stories tremendous stories of, of abundance and diversity um, especially among sockeye, which are really the keystone species for that whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the most important so wild salmon water in the world. 50% of the world's sockeye harvest comes from Bristol Bay, the Bristol Bay drainage, and 30% of the entire world's wild salmon harvest comes from Bristol Bay. So it's an environmentally really, really important area, as well as being a very beautiful, beautiful one. So that's a lot of what motivated me to start going there.